Hello everyone. Today we are going to cover bivariate regression models. The goal of a regression model is to establish causality between a dependent variable and independent variables. It is assumed that the direction of influence is clear, in the sense that we know x influences y and not vice versa. Now, let me illustrate this in a graph first. Now, suppose that you're interested in home prices and you believe that home values are going to be influenced by the square footage of the home. In this particular case, you have the dependent variable price on the vertical axis and you have the independent variable square footage on the horizontal axis. Okay. Now, suppose that I show you three lines to represent the relationship between square feet and price. And suppose that those three lines look as follows. Now, if you look at those three lines, and I ask you, well, which line fits best the relationship between those observations that represent a house for with a particular square footage and the price, then you would most likely tell me that the blue line represents this relationship best, because the red line is too far above and the green line is too far below. Now, what you know intuitively is correct, in the sense that it is the blue line. In this lecture, we are going to show how you can formalize in mathematical language that the blue line is indeed the correct one. Basically, what you know intuitively will be now translated into mathematics. In this lecture, we are going to focus on a bivariate regression model which means that we have one dependent variable and one independent variable. We are going to call the dependent variable y and the independent variable is going to be called x. Now in the case of the bivariate regression model, our goal is to find the best linear relationship between the two variables. And we assume that each observation of y is a function of x plus some random term. If you go back to the example about the uh, housing prices, what we assume is that we have the price of the home is a function of the square footage, and we assume that we have an intercept, which we call beta 0, plus a slope coefficient, which we call beta 1, times the square feet. Okay. Note that in this case, the intercept is beta 0, so this is the intercept, and beta 1 is the slope coefficient. Note that this function is very similar to the linear function which you are all familiar with, which is y is equal to mx plus b, where b is the intercept and m is the slope. So in this particular case, to draw the slope, we have, if we are going one unit on the square footage, then beta 1 is going to represent the slope. Note that we will see that in this particular case, beta 1 represents the dollar per square feet of the home values, of the average home value. Okay. Now, the question is, how do we determine this line? 
Now here I have copied the previous graph again and what we said is that there is a line, a regression line, that fits through all those observations. Okay? And note that each observation represents a different home. Okay? And we have, for example, if you take this observation here, then there is a certain square footage associated with this home, say this is a 1,200 square foot home. And we also have a price associated with this house. And assume it is $150,000. Now, for the moment, suppose that you can represent this linear function here with the following parameters. Um, price is equal to 40,000 plus 100 times square feet. So in this case we have beta 0 is equal to 40,000 and beta 1 equals 100. So in this case, for each additional square foot of your house, the home value would increase by 100. Now, in this case, you can see if beta 0 is 40,000 and beta 1 is 100, then if we have this 1,200 square foot home, we can calculate 40,000 plus 100 times 1,200 equals 160,000. So in this case, our model overestimates the price of this home and estimates this price to be $160,000. Okay? Now assume a different home. Let us assume, for example, this home here. And assume that this home has 1,500 square feet. Then in this case, our model would be 40,000 plus 100 times 1,500 and it would estimate this home to be at $190,000. But in reality, this price, this home is valued more than $190,000. Let us assume for that it is actually valued at $210,000. So you can see that given those parameters, okay, that for some homes, the value is underestimated, and for some homes, the value is overestimated. Okay? Because note that, and we will see this soon, that for no matter how many observations we have, we always only have one beta zero and one beta one. Okay? Now, it is very important to realize that the linear function does not tell us exactly what the home value will be for a given value of x, but it will actually tell us the expected value. So if you think back about the previous lectures in this class, we are calculating the expected value of the price given we have given the square footage. And now note, at the moment our model is very simple in the sense that we only have two variables. That's the name, that's the reason why we call it a bivariate model, in the sense that we have just the price and the square footage. Of course, in reality, the home value is influenced by many more variables. For example, the bedrooms, the bathrooms, if it has hardwood floors, if it has an attached garage, the lot size, location, and so on. 
right? But this will be covered at a later time period. Now, the following we will see of how we actually determine beta 0 and beta 1 such that this line fits best. So let me simply recreate the graph that we had before. And we have the home values on the uh, vertical axis. And we have the square footage on the horizontal axis. Now assume that we have some regression line. And for now, assume that we only have one observation. And let us put this observation right here. Okay. So what I'm about to demonstrate is how we're going to calculate beta 0 and beta 1, or the optimal beta 0 and beta 1. And for the moment, I am just going to focus on one single observation. Of course, there are many more observations, but the technique that I'm applying to this observation can be applied to any other observation as well. Now, suppose that you have this observation, and this observation represents a particular house. Now, this particular house is characterized by square footage, and it is also characterized by a particular price. Now, let us assume that this cross here marks the, uh, marks the, marks the home, but that we have xi, which is the square footage associated with house i, and that you have yi, which is the price of the home associated with house i. Now, we also have this regression equation, and we assume that this regression equation or this linear function can be expressed as y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times xi. Now note that there's still a term missing here, okay, and I'll come to that. Now, for this particular case, we have our regression equation. And in this case, our regression equation underestimates the home value. Let's call the estimated home value based on our model. Let's call it yi, and we put a little hat on here. Okay. Now, our model, we can have xi, say, being equal to 1,500, suppose that the real observation is valued at $210,000, and that our model actually estimates this to be $190,000. Okay, so we have, if you remember back from the previous section where we said beta 0 is 40,000, beta 1 is 100,000. Then in this particular case, we have the 40,000 plus 100 times 1,500. And we know that this gives us 190,000. So we are right here. And so now this is the important part. In order to actually achieve the $210,000, we have to add a correction term. Now, this is not really called a correction term, but it is called an error term. So in this case, the error term is 20,000. So now here, we are adding this error term, and we call it epsilon i. So epsilon is the Greek letter. Now, this epsilon represents the vertical distance between the observation and our line. So this section here represents 
epsilon i. Now note that I have only considered this observation for now and we have calculated the error term associated with this observation. Now, in the previous slide, note that we have many different observations and for each observation we can calculate the distance between the line and the actual observation. Okay? So for each observation we have we could calculate an error term. And now note that for some observations those error terms are going to be positive, like in this case where we determined that the error term is uh, $20,000. $20, okay. So this is a positive error term, but there can also be a negative error term, like in this case here, where we determined that the error term is minus $10,000. Okay. Note that right now I have not said anything about how beta 0 and beta 1 are determined. Those two numbers, 40,000 and 100, 100, those are simply made up numbers to illustrate the concept of the linear function and the concept of the error term. Okay. Now we said that we have an error term associated with each observation. Okay? Then consider, consider this equation here. Okay. And let us rewrite this observation. Okay. Now assume that we have again y i equals beta zero plus beta one times xi plus the error term and let us solve this for the error term. Okay. And so let us have say yi minus beta 0 minus beta 1 times xi is equal to epsilon i. Okay. Now let me write this differently and put epsilon i here, an equal sign, and please leave some space here. Okay? And just write yi minus beta 0 minus beta 1 times xi. Okay? So what this equation here determines is that if I give you any beta 0, any beta 1, and I give you the observation associated with a particular house, you can calcul calculate the error term. So in the previous example, if I told you that beta 0 is 40,000, beta 1 is 100, the house is valued at $210,000 and the square footage is $1,500, what you could plug in is, you could say, uh, 210 minus 40,000 minus 100 times 1,500, that would give you the error term, the 20,000. Okay. Note that for any beta 0 and any beta 1, and also for any uh, homes, you can calculate the error term for each observation. What the regression model is going to do, first of all, since some of those error terms can be positive and some error terms can be negative, we are going to square all the error terms. So if we square the left side, we also have to square the right side. So now we have the error term of a particular observation squared. And then what we are going to do is we are going to sum them all up from i from equal to 1 to n, where n are the number of observations. And when we sum up the left-hand side, we also have to sum up the right-hand side. 
Now this equation is going to play a fundamental role in determining the optimal beta 0 and beta 1. Now to illustrate this, let me go back to the slides. And at the bottom of the slide, we have the equation that I presented, that I just presented, where we have the error term of an individual observation, we square that error term, and then we are summing up the error terms for all the observations. As you can imagine, you want to minimize the error terms. More particular, in this case, you want to minimize the sum of the squared error terms by choosing beta 0 and beta 1 such that this term here on the left-hand side is minimized. Now, very often this model is also called ordinary least square model, or OLS. Now, in order to pick beta 0 and beta 1 such that the sum of the squared residuals or the squared error terms is minimized, some knowledge of calculus is necessary. However, I'm going to skip this and I'm just going to present you the solution. To find the optimal intercept and slope coefficient, the beta 0 and the beta 1, you have to proceed in four steps. In the first step, you have to calculate the mean of your independent variables. If you think back about the home values, that would be the mean of the square footage of all homes in your data set. In the second step, you calculate the mean of the dependent variables. In our case, that would be the average price of all the homes in your data set. Now, the third step, you're going to calculate the slope coefficient, the beta 1. Okay. Note that in order to calculate the slope coefficient beta 1, what you have to do is you have to calculate, you have to take each, uh, each xi or each square footage, or you have to take a particular home, take the square footage, subtract the average square footage, multiply this by the home value minus the average home value, and you have to sum up all of this. And then you have to divide by the individual square footage minus the average square footage squared. Now this may look very complicated and we are actually going to, uh, to look at this, how this is calculated manually, but any regression software is going to do this automatically. Once you have the slope coefficient, you can use this to calculate the intercept. And the intercept is simply the average of the dependent variable minus beta 1, the slope coefficient that you had just calculated, times the average of your dependent, independent variable. Okay. Now, this last equation is actually very important in the sense that what it says is that your regression line is going to go through the average home value and the average square footage home. In the sense that suppose you have this point, suppose you have this point here. Then this point is going to be the average x or the average square footage. And it is the average y. Okay. So the regression line is going through the average values. So what I have drawn on the, on, the, on the whiteboard, I have also generated a computer graphic here where you can see the square footage as the independent variable on the horizontal axis and the price of the home on the vertical axis. Note that each of the dots represents a particular observation, a home value with the associated square footage, and the red dashed line represents the error term associated with the observation. Now note that, and I will come, I will explain this graph uh, more in detail later, that we have a histogram of the residuals or the histogram of the error terms. Okay, you can see that on average, the error term is about zero, and we have some 
houses where the error term is very negative, and we have some homes where the error term is positive. Now, let us see how we would actually calculate the intercept and the slope coefficient given data. For this, I have copied what you have in your slides uh, onto this board here. So, first of all, consider that if you have data, in this case we have miles as the independent variable and we have the price as the dependent variable, that we have to calculate the slope and the intercept using four steps. In the first step, we are going to calculate the average of the dependent variable. In the second step, we are going to calculate the average of the independent variable. So in this case, the average of the dependent variable would be the average price. Now in this case, and you can verify this, the average price is uh, 21.143. 21.143. It is the average of all those values. The average miles are, in this case, are 35. Okay. Note that those values are actually in thousands. Okay, so 35,000 miles is the average, and the average price is uh, $21,143. Okay. So those are the first steps. Now, the third step, which is the most uh, burdensome, is calculating the slope using this equation. Okay. And note that you have this equation in your slides. Okay. So note that we have the average x, we have the average y. And so what we need to do is we have to take each observation. Note that each observation is indicated by i. You have to take the average miles and subtract. Uh, you have to take the miles of a particular car and subtract the average miles. This part here, let me call this part uh, a is what is done in this column here. So we take the, the miles, which is 20, and we subtract the average miles, 35. So 20 minus 35 is equal to 15. Okay. And we do this for each observation. This is what we are doing right here. Now, the second part of this equation, let's call this B, is doing the same for the miles. We take the miles of a particular car, yi, and we subtract the average miles. So in this case, we have 27 minus 21.143 gives us 4.9 something. Okay. Note that here I have done some rounding. Okay. So this column here is step B. Now step the last the, the third step here is to multiply A times B. So in this case, if we multiply negative 15 times 5.9, we get negative 87.9. Now, in the last step, we have to take xi, or the miles of an individual observation, subtract the average miles, and square the value. So in this case, we take negative 15, and we square, we square it, and we get 225. So this is negative 15 squared. Second term is negative 10 squared, and so on. Now note that the numerator has to be summed up. So a times b, and we are taking the sum. So the sum of a times b 
is the sum of the values in this column. And this sum is equal to negative 210. So here we have the numerator. The denominator, we are going to sum up this column here. And the sum of all those values is equal to 700. Now note that now we can calculate the slope coefficient. So beta 1 is equal to negative 210 divided by 700. And hence the slope coefficient is negative 0 0.03. Sorry, negative point three. Okay. So this is how you calculate the slope coefficient. Step four is calculating the intercept. And we said that the intercept which is beta 0, is equal to y bar minus the estimated coefficient times x bar. So in this case, y bar is equal to 21.143 plus 0.3. Note we have a minus sign here, and we have a minus sign here, and hence it's plus times 35. And hence the intercept term is going to be 31.643. Okay. So if you're thinking about the data, then the linear function that describes this data best is has 31.643 as the intercept and negative 3 as the slope. Now, of course, those calculations are very burdensome, and you will see that this is much easier once we are going to use R for it. But for, before we do so, let me illustrate this example in Excel. So note that here in Excel, I have the miles, and I have the price. This is identical to what you have seen on the slides before. Now what you can do in Excel is you can plot a scatter plot. So here we have charts, let us do a scatter plot. Okay. Note that the relationship here between the miles and the price is negative, which makes sense that the longer or the further you drive your car, the lower the value. Now what you can do in Excel is you can click on a particular observation, you can right click on a particular observation, and there's a function that is called add trend line. So if you click on the add trend line, then it gives you, it adds a line between those observations. This is what we have seen at the beginning of the lecture. And then on the right hand side, you also have the option that says display equation on chart. So if you click this, what you can see is that the values that we have just calculated manually, in a sense the 31.643 as the intercept and the negative 0.3 as the slope, is exactly identical to what we have calculated uh, manually in this example here, 31.643 and negative 0.3. So now you understand how Excel calculates this trend line and how you could actually calculate this manually as well. Now let us run our first regression model in MATLAB. Here we are going to enter the miles first, which is our independent variable. And the miles are 20, 25, 30, and so on. And the dependent variable is the price. So here we have 23, uh, 27, 23, 
23, and so on. Now, to run a linear regression model with MATLAB, we have to use the command fitLM, where the LM stands for linear model, so fit linear model. And we have to first enter the independent variable, which is the miles. And then we have to enter the dependent variable, which is the price. Now note that in the future, you do not have to enter the data manually, but you can simply load it from a CSV file. So when we execute the model, or when we execute the fit LM command, we are getting this linear regression model. And for now, we are only going to focus on the column called estimate. And we are going to look at all the in other information presented in the output uh, over the next lectures. Note that the estimate or the intercept is 31.64 and the slope coefficient x1 is equal to negative 0.3. Note that MATLAB also tells you the number of observations, which are seven observations. So now you know of how to calculate a very simple bivariate regression model manually with Excel and with MATLAB. We started with three lines, and we said that we want the regression line that fits the observations the best. And we said that this line can be represented by an intercept and by a slope. We have then determined the error terms associated with the various observations. And we said that the beta 0 and the beta 1, which determines the form of the, of the function, which fits the observation the best, is obtained by minimizing the, the sum of the squared error terms. This is what we have done with this equation here. And finally, we have then applied the result of that equation to calculate the intercept and the slope manually. But of course, you can also calculate those intercept and slope coefficients by using Excel and also by using R or any other statistical software. Note that Excel is very good at calculating the slope and the intercept for a bivariate model. But what we are going to do in the future is well beyond that. Hello, everyone. In the last lecture, we have seen how to calculate the intercept beta 0 and the slope beta 1 for a bivariate regression model. In this lecture, we provide meaning to those coefficients. Because remember, if you have data and the equations, you can plug in the data into the equations and you're going to get results for beta 0 and beta 1. But the goal of any regression model is to provide causality of how the independent variables influence the dependent variables. The coefficients alone are not going to tell you anything about the direction or the strength of this relationship. This is what will be covered in this lecture. Now, before we continue, I would like to cover certain assumptions that are necessary for the bivariate regression model and also the multivariate regression model, which we are going to see in the next lecture, to work. Those assumptions are very important in order to get unbiased estimates of our coefficients. The first assumption is that the linear regression model is valid. Note that we are not looking at a linear relationship between the variables, but that we are looking at a linear model. And I will get to this in the future. We also assume that the disturbance terms or the error terms epsilon have an average value of zero or the mean value is zero. We also assume homoscedasticity and I will provide an example of what that is in the next lecture. We also have that there is no correlation between the disturbance terms and we must assume that the number of observations is greater than the number of parameters. 
The last assumption is that there is no multicollinearity, or at least no perfect multicollinearity in our model. And I will explain what that is later on. Note that when we are talking about a linear regression model, we assume a regression model which is linear in parameters. So for example, in the past lecture we have had an a dependent variable y, which is a function of beta 0 plus beta 1, and times xi, which is the independent variable. Note that the following models are also linear in parameters. So for example, take the second equation here, which is yi equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times xi plus beta 2 times xi squared. Then note that we have beta 1 times x and beta 2 times x squared, that this is also a linear equation. However, if you are going to graph this, you will see that the function is not linear, but it's actually a curve. And again, I will provide an example of this later. We have talked a lot about natural logarithms in the context of this class, and we will see that the natural logarithm also provides a very important insights into models. Now, here is a recreation of the graph that you have seen in the previous lecture, where we were looking at home prices and square footage. On the left side, you see the observations, you see the regression line, and you also see the red dashed lines, which represent the error terms. On the right side, you see a histogram of the residuals. This is basically the size of the red dashed bars on the left side represented in a histogram. As you can see, on average, the values are zero. They are also normally distributed. Homoscedasticity is a very important assumption for the coefficient estimates and also the standard errors to be unbiased. Now, the best way to explain homoscedasticity is to compare it with a heteroscedastic model. This is what I have done on the next slide. On the left-hand side, you see homoscedastic data. You have the square footage and you have the price, and you can see that the variance of the error terms along the line remains constant. Now think about that you have a constant, um, constant variance across the lines. Compare this to the right-hand side graph, where for small square footages you have a little bit of variance in the error terms, and for large square footages you have a lot of variance in the error terms. Think about this as the size of the home gets larger, there may be much more variance in terms of price of the home. I have recreated this graph here, and so for homoscedastic data, think about that you have a constant bandwidth along the regression line, like this, and that for heteroscedastic data, you have this increasing variance. Note it can also be decreasing variance, think about simply as non-constant variance around the regression line. We will see that the slope coefficients are still unbiased, but that the standard errors are going to be biased. And we will see that the standard errors need to be unbiased to make meaning out of our models. <clears throat> now, other assumptions, other important assumptions are that there is no correlation or no autocorrelation between the error terms and that there's also no covariance or correlation between the error terms and the individual independent variables. We also need to have what is called full rank of the model. Note that this assumption is usually not, um, is usually given, uh, given your data. It only also, it says that you need to have more observations than variables to estimate. Think about that you cannot solve for three unknowns with only two equations. <clears throat> 
And the last assumption is that we do not have perfect multicollinearity. For this class, you can assume that the assumptions are satisfied for the data you are working with. Okay, so now we are going to look at measuring the strength of the relationship. To measure the strength of the hypothesized relationship between the dependent and the independent variables of the regression equation, we are going to calculate a value which is called r squared. The value of R squared can be thought of as an indicate, indicator of goodness of fit, or how well the sample regression line fits your sample data. To see how this statistic is used, we decompose the variation of Y in the sample into two components, the unexplained variation and the explained variation. Let me explain the concept of explained and unexplained variation graphically. Consider the graph on home values where the independent variable is home values and the independent variable is square footage. We have a regression line that is characterized by price equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times the square footage. And we said before that any regression line goes through the average value of x and y. So in this case, the regression line goes through the average square footage and the average price. So note that we have one observation up here, and let's call this observation xi and yi. Note that I have called the average price and the average square footage p bar and, uh, and sqf t bar, but let's make it this consistent with the lecture notes that you have in your, on that you can find on Canvas. And let's just call it y bar and x bar. Now <clears throat> consider you are starting here at this average point, and what you want your regression model to do is if you are moving away from this point, so if you are having a variation in x, so if you have a variation in the square footage, then you want your model to translate this into a variation of price because you want to know of if the square footage varies, how does the price vary. So think about you're moving in away from the average point. So you're moving from x bar to xi then you want your model to actually translate this movement in x into a movement in y. So in this particular case, this movement in x is indeed translated into a movement of y, in the sense that y is increasing, or the price of the home is increasing if you are increasing the square footage. Now in this particular case, we have the observation xi, and this translates into a price of yi for, the, for this particular home, which is the, the real observation in your model, in your data. Now, as you can see, your model only explains part of this variation in y. So you have this part here is going to be the explained variation. up to this point here. But then there is this entire part here which is unexplained. And this is going to be called the unexplained variation. Now the total movement which we observe in the data from y bar to yi. This total distance 
is called the total variation. If your model was perfect, the movement from x bar to xi, your model, if your model was perfect, it could explain the total variation. However, any model will not be perfect, and hence there will always be an unexplained variation. Now think about the to total variation to be 100%, and say in this case your explained variation is only 60%, and the unexplained variation is the remaining 40%, or re represents the remaining 40%. Okay. Now here we only look at one particular observation, but this is true for any observation that we have in our model given our regression line. To put very simply, the R squared in this case can be thought as the ratio of the explained variation over the total variation. So in this case, the R squared would be 0.6. Okay. Now we will see that the R squared has to be equal, is always limited between 0 and 1. Okay. The R squared can be 0, it can be 1, or anything in between. It cannot be negative and it cannot be larger than 1. So think of the R squared as a percentage that explains that explains your model, okay. or as a percentage of how much your model explains the total variation. Okay. So if you go back to the slides, okay, we have the the residual variation or the residual or the unexplained variation which is yi minus yi hat. So in this case here, note that we have yi hat right here, going exactly to this, to this point here. Okay. So the unexplained variation is yi minus yi hat. The explained variation is yi hat minus y bar. So this is the um, unexplained variation. This is the explained variation. And then the last one, I have to write it down here, is yi minus y bar, which is the total variation. Okay. This is represented in the three terms which you see on this slide here. Now, we said before that you can think about the R squared as the explained sum of squares over the total sum of squares. And remember, in the graph that I showed you before, we are just looking at one variable, but in, or one observation, but in reality we have many observations. And this is represented here, okay, where we are summing over all the observations, and we are squaring and summing all the distances. So the R squared is the explained sum of squares over the total sum of squares. Note that in many regression models, and if you are using statistical software, you have also what is called the adjusted R squared. Okay? Now this will become important when we are looking at multiple independent, variable, independent variables, 
in, when you're talking about multivariate regression. It can be shown that the R squared is increasing if we have a very large number of observations or if you have a very large number of explanatory variables. In order for this increase, which is due to, due to mathematical theory, in order to correct for this increase, statistical software also reports the adjusted R squared. So think about this as a correction factor. The next aspect or the next topic is going to be very important for the remainder of the semester. And this is what is called hypothesis testing of the coefficients. Now, we have talked about hypothesis testing before, and we will see why this is important in the regression model. The good news is that any statistical software is going to make a hypothesis test for you while providing the output data. Consider the model where we have price is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times the square footage. If for some reason beta 1 was equal to 0, what this means is that no matter how you vary the square footage, if you multiply it by something that is 0, it does not have an effect on the price. Okay, So if beta 1 was 0, then square footage would not influence price. Now, what any statistical software is doing is setting up a hypothesis test and also executing that hypothesis test. And that hypothesis test is as follows. We have H0, the null hypothesis, and H0 is that the intercept and the slope coefficients are equal to 0, and the alternative hypothesis is that those slope coefficients or intercept are not equal to 0. Okay. Now, Note that since we only have, you, we usually have only one sample, we can estimate the standard error for the slope coefficient, and we can also estimate the standard error for the intercept. Note that estimating the standard error also depends on the sample size. Okay, The larger the sample size, the smaller your standard error is going to be. This is very similar to the hypothesis test that we have seen in previous lectures. Okay, Now, don't worry too much about those equations, because any statistical software is going to execute those hypothesis tests for you. Okay, Now, think about the hypothesis test in the case of uh, a sample which we have seen in the past. Okay. So if we are doing what is called a t-test, then the test statistic is equal to the mean x-bar minus the hypothesized value divided by the standard error. Okay. Now, in the case of a hypothesis test in a regression model, the hypothesized value, the hypothesized mean, is equal to zero. So the test statistic in a regression model is simply the coefficient divided by the standard error of the coefficient. And this follows a t-distribution. With n minus 2 degrees of freedom in the case of a bivariate regression model. 
because in a bivariate model we are estimating two coefficients, the intercept and the slope. Now, this is what you have illustrated on this slide. Now let us apply what we just learned using the dataset Honda. Now the dataset Honda contains observations, a total of 81 observations, of the price and the miles of a used Honda Accord in the Indianapolis region, okay? So you have the miles and you also have the price column, okay? So let us fit a linear regression model to the data explaining the price of the Honda based on miles. So we write B hat equals fit LM, then we are going to slightly modify from what we have seen before in the sense that we now have a data set that is called Honda. So we type in Honda, comma, and then we type in the equation that we would like to have estimated. So in this case, it is price, and then we separate the dependent variable from the independent variable with the tilde sign. So it's price tilde miles, and we execute this line. Now note that we have the regression output in the command window, but I have also created a new object which is called b hat or beta hat. This is the reason why I called it beta hat equals fit lm. Think about the beta b hat object as containing all the information associated with this model. And we will see that there are some pretty neat applications based on the beta hat object which we have just presented or created. Now, let us look at the output first, at the regression output first. So again, you have the intercept, which is 22,052, and you have the estimate of negative 0.065. Now, how you interpret this estimate of miles is as follows. Given any Honda Accord, if you drive one additional mile on your car, then the price decreases by, or the value of the car decreases, by 6.5 cents. Now note that the intercept is a little bit more difficult to interpret. Actually, we will see soon that in this case and in many other cases, you cannot really interpret the intercept or the meaning of the intercept. But note that you now have those three columns where SE stands for the standard error, TSTAT is the test statistic, and p-value is the p-value, which we have seen from the hypothesis tests that we have conducted previously. Now, let us consider the miles coefficient and the standard error associated with the miles coefficient. Note that the miles coefficient is again negative 0.065 and the standard error associated with the miles coefficient is 0 0.0125. Note that the coefficient estimate for miles is negative 0 0.065, which is our beta 1. And the standard error associated with beta 1 is estimated to be negative 0 0.0125. Now the hypothesis test is that beta 1 is equal to 0 and the alternative hypothesis is that beta 1 is different from 0. Note that here we are talking about the estimated value whereas here we are talking about the population value. So to calculate the test statistic, we have to take negative 
zero zero six five divided by negative uh, sorry divided by zero point zero one two five and what we get is negative five point one nine eight so if you remember from the hypothesis testing we have we have the t distribution and we have the hypothe hypothesized value of zero. Okay, so here we hypothesize that beta one is equal to zero. Now we calculate a t statistic, a test statistic of negative 5.198. Now this value is to the left and suppose that it is here. Now this probability tells us what is the probability of observing the estimate of negative 0 0.065 under the hypothesis or given the null hypothesis. And you can see that this value is extremely small. Okay, So that basically represents the probability right here. Since we are testing, usually we are testing at 5% or 10%, okay? that means that in this case we are rejecting the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is that that coefficient is zero. As I mentioned before, we have created the object b hat, which co contains all the information associated with the model that we have just estimated. So, for example, if you want to plot the observations as well as the regression line, you can type in b hat dot, and then note that you have a bunch of additional functions that you can use and that you can access through this object b hat. In this particular case, we are interested in the plot. So we can look for plot. We can hit enter. And what we get is the regression line, which is the red line. We have the blue crosses are all the observations. Okay. So you can go, for example, on a particular observation and it tells you what the x and the y is. In this case, x are the miles and y would be the price. And it also gives you the confidence bounds. Okay, so that is one way of why you would like to create the object b hat instead of simply running the command fit lm without uh, storing it into, a, into the object. Now note that you can also look at this, uh, this graph in more in particular. You can also save it, for example, um, into, a, into a picture and then import it into a Word document. Now, we mentioned before that one of the assumptions associated with the model is that the residuals or the error term are normally distributed around zero. So you can check that as well, at least visually. You can type, for example, b hat dot plot, and then uh, you can look at the residuals. And now here you have a plot, a histogram that plots the residuals. So you see, for example, that we have a lot of mass on the around zero and that we have uh, a very high uh, 
error term that is above 5000 right here. But in general, that we have a mass here and it tapers off uh, towards the end. Now, the last item that I would like to show that is incorporated into the B hat is that you also have the fitted values. Now, to display the fitted values, what we are going to do, we are going to take the Honda table, which we already have and contains all our data, and add a fourth column that contains the fitted value. The fitted values are those values that, based on our model, based on the equation that we have seen before, is going to predict, based on mileage, what the price of the car would be. To do so, you type in B hat plot, that, uh, sorry, you type in a Honda dot, say, fitted values, okay, and you can name this uh, however you want, is equal to B hat dot, and then for in B hat, those values are called fitted. And now you see that MATLAB has added a fourth column. So for example, if you are taking the first car, the first car has 37,329 miles and costs $17,500. Based on our model, we would value that car at $19,625, okay? So think about when you are uh, going on a web page like uh, Kelly Blue Book to estimate the value of your car, and you have to answer uh, the mileage, the conditions, the special equipment, and Kelly Blue Book will give you an estimated value. Now, this estimated value corresponds to the fitted value in this last column here. Mm -hmm. Now, the last item that I just mentioned was uh, about the additional information that you would feed into Kelly Blue Book to determine the value of the car. Now, note that here in this particular model, we only have one, uh, one type of information, and that's the miles of the car. And note that the adjusted R squared is 0.245. What this means is that mileage alone explains 24%, 24.5% of the variation in price. Okay, So of course, if you are adding more and more variables, then that R square would be increasing. A very important aspect in regression analysis is to interpret the statistical significance. Now note that the statistical significance is represented by the p-value in this last column here. There are three levels of statistical significance. The first level if, is if the p-value is below 10%, and that is usually marked with one star. This is what, you will, what we will see in uh, scientific papers. If the p-value is below 5%, then this is marked with two stars. And if it's below 1%, it is marked with three little stars. What this means is that when you open a scientific paper or any a report that has executed a, a statistical analysis, then all you have to do is you can look at the result table and you look at which coefficients or which variables have uh, stars associated with them. If there is at least one star, this means that the coefficient is statistically significant, meaning that it is different or there is strong evidence that it is different from zero. If the coefficient is different from zero, this means that there is evidence that the variable associated with that coefficient has an influence on the dependent variable. Now, we mentioned before that one of the assumptions is that the regression model is linear in coefficients. Now note that linear in coefficients doesn't mean that the relationship between two variables is a linear one. Here, 
I have plotted a total of uh, six graphs, and all of those graphs are linear in coefficients. Okay. Now we have, in this case, we have the log of y. This is represents the natural log. Okay. Uh, and so that's uh, this this one here. And all the only thing that changes is uh, beta two. Okay. Now note that you have a straight line here, but you also have nonlinear functions or nonlinear relationships, which you can present with something that is linear in coefficients. The same is true. Uh, the same is true on the right side. Okay, where I have expressed the function actually as a polynomial, where we have uh, y, and we have a one x, and all, all that changes is beta three and beta four. Okay, and you can see the values of beta three and beta four here, and you can see that you can represent nonlinear relationships. Once we are going into the, once we are getting into the multivariate regression, you will see under which circumstances a nonlinear uh, term, or in this case a squared term, makes uh, sense. Now, the last issue that I would like to talk about is something that is related to the intercept. So before we said that when we looked at the Honda example, we said that we cannot interpret the intercept or we have difficulties interpreting the intercept. Now, let me illustrate to you what this means. And note that this is not only valid for the example about the used car, but this is valid in general. So think about you have the regression plot where you have miles, and price. Now, in our case, when you look at the data from the Honda model, what you observe is that the prices are within a particular interval of, say, uh, 20,000 miles and, say, 60,000 miles. So all the observations that we have are within those two bounds. And within those two bounds, we actually assume a linear relationship. So our data looks like this. And we have created a linear function that is beta zero plus beta one times miles is equal to the price. Now note that our model or any regression model does provide you an intercept. And that intercept is measured here. Now, when you know something about how the value of a car evolves over time, what you know is that basically the biggest loss in revenue or the biggest loss in value of the car it happens when you drive it off the lot. Because at that point, your car becomes a used car and it's not a new car anymore. So the relationship between miles and price is nonlinear in the sense that you have rapid depreciation at the beginning and then and then it flattens out okay now this is the reason why you should not use the intercept to say something about the value of a new car in this case because your data range only covers 20 to 60,000 miles. And all you can say is, if you have a new car into the 
if you bring in a new car into the data set, then, or if you want to predict the value of a car uh, based on the mileage, then that car has to be between 20 and 60,000 miles. Basically, your model is not valid if it's, if uh, any new observation is outside the data range. Okay. So this is what you have to keep in mind when interpreting the intercept. Note that in most cases, it is not necessary or not useful to interpret the intercept.